Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club program. My name is Melissa Kane. I'm a political analyst and I'll be the moderator for today's program. Now, as the club continues to host these kinds of virtual events, they are grateful for the continued support of their members and donors. So please visit commonwealthclub.org to learn more about membership or support the club now by sending a tax deductible gift with the blue donate button right there on your screen. And it is my pleasure to be introducing the literally the man of the hour today. Speaker John Boehner was born and raised in Ohio. He's the second of 12 children, and he started working at his family's bar at a very young age and was the first person in his family to attend college. He served as an Ohio state representative and spent nearly 25 years in Congress. And during his tenure, he served as the House Minority Leader and the House Majority Leader before being elected speaker in 2011. Now, in his new book, On the House, a Washington memoir, we have here. Um, <laughs> this is a colorful reflection on his years of public service and the presidents and the politicians that he encountered along the way, both in Washington, D.C. and on numerous golf courses. And just a quick reminder to our viewers, if you have a question for Speaker Boehner, please submit those in the chat. And now, without further ado, allow me to welcome to the Commonwealth Club, Speaker John Boehner. Well, Melissa, thank you, and uh, good afternoon to you and to uh, all who are tuning in. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, this discussion today. You know, I uh, uh, writing books was not, I don't write books, it's not what I do. Uh, but over the years after I retired, I thought, you know, I've had a pretty interesting life, very interesting career. Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think I could write a book that'd be pretty interesting. And so I set about doing it and uh, finally got it finished. And, uh, and here we are. And so with that, Melissa, fire away. Well, so I looked at some of the reviews. Your book's doing very well. It's been reviewed in sort of all the fancy publications. And the one that I thought uh, did a really good job of sort of summarizing was from the L.A. Times, um, where they wrote, uh, quote, reading John Boehner's political memoir is probably a lot like just sitting down next to an old timer at the bar where he used to work growing up in Ohio. There's a lot of talk about the way things used to be. And before you know it, you have had one too many and you're not sure just how you're going to get home. <laughs> so uh, it is a very conversational book, right? Is that Was that what you set out to do? It really feels like you're sitting with someone just telling you stories. Can you talk about your process and what you meant to do here? Well, what I, what I was attempting to do was uh, one to be me. You know, I've... Uh, I say in my book, my greatest success after 25 years in Congress is that I walked out there pretty much the same jackass that walked in. And, uh, you know, I'm known for being candid, uh, sometimes being funny, being straightforward. And, um, and I wanted the book uh, to sound like me. Man, trust me, it sounds like me. Uh, but uh, uh, I wanted it to be interesting. I've read enough political memoirs in my life uh, and realized I did not want to write a book like all those other ones that I've read. And so uh, I, wanted it to, I wanted it to sound conversational. I really did not want to have to record my audio book. I, you know, I've just uh, a lot of work. Uh, I just, I really didn't want to do it, but my friends and my staff just beat on me to no end. And, uh, and so uh, it was, that was really hard to do. But it's the same thing there. I wanted it to, to sound like I was having a conversation with a person listening. So it all worked out fine, thankfully. Yeah, I mean, it really, it really is. It's a very, I found myself, you know, finishing it far too early. I'd set aside a certain amount of time and I flew right through because it's just, it just moves along so well. And a number of your stories sort of take place on golf courses, of course, and especially with uh, a certain former Senator 
Joe Biden. And you you talk pretty, uh, pretty positively about President Biden and, and about your friendship with him. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and how do you think he's doing as president? Well, listen, Joe Biden and I have been friends for 30 years. Uh, he's a traditional Democrat. I would describe myself as a traditional Republican. Uh, but, you know, we're uh, both uh, Roman Catholic. Uh, both grew up in kind of the same kind of circumstances. And uh, I don't know. Well, we seem to understand each other. And uh, during the five years I was speaker, he was the vice president. And there were a number of times that uh, on behalf of the Biden or Obama administration, uh, he'd step in and be the negotiator uh, between uh, the White House and the Congress. And so uh, we had a few more times that we could spend with each other. Uh, but then, you know, every year or sometimes twice a year, there'd be a joint session of Congress uh, where the president would speak. And Joe Biden, as president of the Senate, uh, would uh, join me on the dais, and we'd sit uh, behind President Obama. And so, uh, you know, while we're waiting for the festivities to start and uh, the president to, to finally be introduced, uh, we'd spend uh, ample time uh, up on the dais by ourselves. I think one year, I don't know, it was 2011 or 2012, uh, I was talking to him about a golf game I had played the previous summer. Uh, where I shot, you know, I shot even par. And I was kind of proud of it. And I was telling Joe all about it. And uh, finally, my staff came running over uh, to say, it's all live. And here the president's mic, his microphone, was picking up our entire conversation. <laughs> Thank goodness we were talking about golf. And, uh, and it's good to know, like, that's it, what you guys are talking about. That, well, like, it's, it's, been, uh, you know, it could have been a lot of other things, but... It was just golf. Well, it was great that you you talked about what it's like to be the speaker and to sit. You have to sit there without moving a single muscle uh, while yeah, the, the president the, gives the speech. Yeah, it's the president's night, uh, and uh, anything I would have done uh, would have gotten me in trouble. <laughs> and so uh, I decided early on I wasn't. I'd seen other speakers sit up there and do things that they shouldn't have done. And uh, it got excoriated by the press over it. And so I, I decided I'm just going to stare at the back of President Obama's head and not make one facial expression. The only thing that was ever reported uh, about uh, me and the State of the Union was that some reporters suggested I looked bored. But weren't you, though? A little bit. No, I wanted to go, what the <laughs> are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do a million things, roll my eyes. I could have done a million things, but I didn't do any of them. I just sat there and behaved myself. Yeah, I always wondered what it, what it, what goes through the mind of the people who have to sit there on camera uh, for <laughs> and sort of endure the speech. Uh, you you write about um, President Clinton and Obama, and you both sort of and you say about both of them in, in different ways that they they had run uh, as a moderate or sort of as a sort of post partisan president and then you know sort of tacked left when they got into office um for uh, bill clinton it was with the you know the uh, health care well actually both of them it was really health care reform um how is, is joe biden falling into that same pattern or do you think he's um <sighs> he's sticking with what he uh what he ran on what do you make of his his, his tenure so well uh listen no. We've got a 50-50 House, essentially, a 50-50 Senate, and Joe Biden won the presidential election, frankly, narrowly, uh, which is uh, a prescription for divided government. And, uh, and frankly, the only things are going to get done are going to get done in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, and so, but I've watched uh, from the beginning of the year, and uh, when push comes to shove, Joe's always uh, try to keep his party together and it's kind of lean to the left. The progressive caucus is, uh, is breathing down his neck. Uh, and there's been this skirmish underway, frankly, since election day. Uh, and, uh, every time he kind of moves to the left to keep the progressives, uh, in the party, uh, it's kind of a backhand to Republicans. And as a result, uh, it's hard to do a bipartisan deal when there is no bipartisanship. And so it's going to be interesting here in the coming months to see how this plays out, because uh, as an example, this infrastructure bill is not going to happen on a partisan basis. I don't think the Democrats have the votes 
uh, to do it on a partisan basis. And so, uh, uh, but, you know, Joe's in a tough spot. Uh, I, I have a lot of empathy for him, or frankly, anybody uh, who serves in the office of president. It's uh, the toughest job in the country, and uh, I think he'll do fine, but he's got his hands full. Well, you know, you write that, that Nancy Pelosi also has her hands full, and, and we're going to talk a lot about the Freedom Caucus and your time as speaker, but I just wanted to transition here because you uh, you also write that, look, at least when you were dealing with the Freedom Caucus, they the difference was tactics, not actual policy, but that among um, the Democrats, there are actually big differences in policy preferences between certain parts of the party and others. And you wrote, um, you know, about Nancy Pelosi. (laughs) I can tell you with absolute certainty that she knows they are a bunch of kooks. Unlike them, Nancy lives in the real world. I can't say I know anyone else on the Democratic side who can keep them in line as well as she can or keep them from destroying themselves with some batch team they're all screwed when she is off the scene uh so you talk a little bit about what it takes uh especially when you've got people with not just tactical differences but policy differences well uh, in america we've been blessed by having an essentially a two-party system uh you know uh, there are some third parties but frankly not all that relevant and uh because we essentially have a two-party system uh, we've got a lot of factions in each of the two political parties. And, uh, you know, I had mine with uh, what I call the knuckleheads. Uh, people want to call them conservatives, but uh, they're not conservatives. They're anarchists. Uh, and uh, Pelosi has her challenges, too. She's got traditional Democrats who helped her become the majority and helped her become speaker, uh, whose political lives are threatened uh, by the interest of the far left. And the far left has been kind of dominating things. Pelosi is trying to balance this out and hold it together. And, uh, you know, the last couple of years, she's done a very good job holding it together. I don't know how long it'll last, but we'll see. Well, you have some really nice, you know, we're, we're it's the Commonwealth Club of California, but of course, based in San Francisco. So um, it was, uh, you know, you, you wrote some pretty positive things about about Nancy Pelosi and, and how she um she may be the most powerful speaker of the house in my lifetime, maybe the most powerful ever. What's uh, what's her secret? What is the, how does she, you said she strong arms her members. How does she do that? If you, you know, if you know. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I've watched her operate. There's some stories in the book that uh, demonstrate how tough she can be. Uh, I don't want to say mean, I don't have a mean bone in my body. This is not what I do, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, she can be, uh, she can be persuasive but she can also be rather ruthless at times. And, uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's more about listening. You know, I, uh, I, I know what it takes uh, to try to keep, keep the team together. Uh, I have my successes. I have my failures. Uh, but uh, the biggest, uh, uh, biggest asset I had in getting there was listening. And I think she's a, she does a good job of listening and understanding where her members are and what's doable and what's not. Uh, which is the key, to, I think, to being a good leader. Yeah, it's interesting here. Um, being a journalist in the Bay Area, every few years when there's an election for for speaker or Democratic Party leader, and there's always a challenge to Pelosi, and there's always the speculation, will she or won't she? And it's just, it's such a um, foregone conclusion. You know, you go, she'll be speaker as long as she wants to be speaker. And, uh, and, and, when she doesn't anymore, because you can't be it forever, uh, it's it's hard to know, uh, as you write in the book, really what's going to happen to the party without that kind of strong leader. Yeah, there's no uh, there's no heir apparent. There's no real clear uh, number two uh, when uh, when she leaves uh, because you know she's 81 years old. Steny Hoyer, the number two guy, is 81. Clyburn, the number three guy, is 82 or so. And uh, and I'm pretty sure that none of them. Uh, are going to be in the mix. And uh, once you get past those three, uh, it's a wide open contest on the Democrat side. And uh, and I, I have not a clue uh, who can be her replacement uh, probably in about a year and a half. Uh, now, you were, when you left the speakership, um, Paul Ryan was your successor. Now, you don't really talk about him much in the book, except to say he was uh, upset about how smoky you left the speaker's office. 
How do you think, how do you think he did? Uh, Paul Ryan's a great guy. I think he did a nice job as speaker. Uh, the really interesting part of this story is that uh, 1990, when I was the first time candidate for Congress, I had a student at Miami of Ohio putting yard signs up for me named Paul Ryan. And uh, I helped him get elected uh, uh, to Congress uh, some eight years later and uh, helped him become chairman of the Budget Committee, helped him become chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. And Paul Ryan is a policy guy. He's not a political guy. Now, he learned he learned a little politics along the way and learned a lot more when he became speaker. Uh, but policy was his thing. And once the uh, 2017 uh, tax overhaul bill passed, I knew I knew he was going to depart. And he did. Uh, but uh, a really solid member, solid guy. Uh, had, the, had his hands full just like I did, uh, as anybody would at this point. Uh, such a small world, such as that he was your former former volunteer. What uh, now? Also, you know, we're in California. I have to ask about Kevin McCarthy. You know, he was supposed to be the next one, uh, the next speaker, and then I think the conventional wisdom is he went on Hannity and maybe let it slip that the Benghazi hearings might have at least some political interest there in uh in in doing some well he, Hillary Clinton. he did but the funny thing is there was no politics at all about it but why he said it i don't know but at the end of the day uh he didn't have the votes uh when i stepped down and, but do you know why that uh, is pardon me do you know why that is oh uh, some of the freedom caucus members the knuckleheads uh, didn't want to vote for him and uh, and it was pretty clear the votes weren't going to be there and so uh, he dropped out. Okay. Well, then I realized there was exactly one person in the U.S. House who could get 218 votes to be Speaker, Paul Ryan. <laughs> uh, because I announced I was going to leave at the end of October 2015 or when my successor retired or when, when my successor was elected. And uh, I wasn't going to walk out of there without having somebody in place. It'd be like a classroom of 434 kindergartners without a teacher. And so uh, uh, I called Paul Ryan. Boehner, I don't want to do this. I know you don't want to do it, Paul, but did you ever think about what God wants you to do? I laid every ounce of Catholic guilt I could on him. In the middle of all this, uh, it was like four phone calls one afternoon. Uh, in the middle of all this, I uh, had my chief of staff call a friend of mine, the Archbishop of New York, Cardinal Dolan. Uh, Dolan and I have been good friends. Uh, and I, was, I just had this, I just had this thing in the back of my mind jump and say, oh yeah, Dolan used to be the Archbishop of Milwaukee and friend of Paul Ryan's. So my chief of staff called Cardinal Dolan, sit, laid out the picture and uh, on my behalf, asked him if he would call uh, Paul Ryan. Tell the speaker I'm on it. So about 30 minutes later, my phone rings, and it's Paul Ryan. Well, you SOB, you've got the cardinal calling me. I said, yes, I do. And if you don't say yes pretty soon, I'm going to have the Pope calling you. Uh, listen, when you announce you're going to leave, you want to you make sure you're leaving. And all of a sudden, it looked like I could be there an extra day or two or a week or two or a month or a year. And I was having nightmares during the day. So... I wanted to make sure I got him locked up. Wow. You really went way over his head for that. That's pretty amazing. And how interesting that you had to talk him into uh, such a, you know, an important position in the yeah, house. He really he didn't, want to, he didn't want to do that. He's a policy guy. He didn't want to have to manage all that, all that chaos that he saw me managing every day. He didn't want to part of it. I don't want well, to. Why did you step down from Congress? Why not just hand over the gavel and keep your seat? Why did you have to, why did you leave? Oh, no, no, no. Well, listen, back in the early 90s, uh, my first term in Congress actually was coming to a close. And, uh, one of our senior members, I was about um, early 40s, one of our senior guys, uh, mid-60s, was retiring, and I went over to him. And I said, why are you leaving? You're one of the good guys around here. He said, Boehner, I'm going to leave here when I know who I am and where I am. I'm not going to be like some of these people walking around here. And I thought to myself, yeah, uh, if I, I don't think I'll be here that long. Uh, but if I am, I'm not going to be here either. I wasn't going to be one of those old folks walking around the Congress, uh, didn't know when to leave. Mm -hmm. And so uh, 
actually before I was sworn in as speaker, I thought to myself, you know, if I can do this four years, uh, that'll be enough. You know, I, I'll just, that's enough for me. I'll be able to, I'll just leave. Well, then Eric Cantor uh, lost his primary election in 2014. And uh, I didn't think MacArthur was quite ready to take my job. So I th thought, well, I guess I have to stick around another year. And so I was uh, planning to leave at the end of 2015 anyway. I was going to announce it in November. Uh, but the day the Pope was there, my, the, the day before I made my announcement, uh, was the happiest day I'd seen in the 25 years I'd been in Congress. The Democrats, Republicans, House, Senate, staff, uh, everybody was thrilled with uh, uh, the Pope's visit. And later on in the afternoon, I went to my chief of staff who knew what my plan was. I said, you know what? I might just make this announcement tomorrow. He said, why not? And so we had a bunch of family in town and guests in town and went to dinner with them. And I got up the next morning and walked up to Starbucks with my boys, my security guys, which I do every morning. And I read for about an hour thinking about this. And then about seven o'clock, walked up to Peach Diner, uh, where a little greasy spoon. I eat breakfast at most mornings. And I'm walking back uh, uh, to my place on the hill and uh, walking past St. Peter's Church on 2nd Street on the house side of the Capitol. And right next to St. Peter's Church is a grotto uh, with a statue of the Virgin Mary. And I'm also down the street with my guys, and I glance over to the statue, and I went, yep, today's the day. <laughs> and it was. It was a sign. It was. Um, now, I want to... Talk to you. you know, this is this was just <laughs> there's so I laughed so hard reading this book. And but one of my favorite parts, uh, you you're the chapter, and you can see this the chapter about being house speaker, you call the mayor of crazy town. Like that's the name of the chapter. And uh, so I do want to get to your speakership. Uh and and you you lay a lot of the blame um for you know what went on at the feet of, it seems like Mark Levin, or at least that's sort of one of the people you, you point to um, as you sort of helping to usher in this class of folks um, in 2010 that, that gave the Republicans the majority um, that you. Well, you had all these uh, talk radio people, some cable news people, uh, you know, they're all fighting for a bigger audience. And, uh, and I noticed uh you know, I don't know, 08, 09, uh, that, you know, Levin and some of these people started to go what I'll call crazy right. Uh, you know, it's all about the birther stuff uh, with Obama and, uh, and other kinds of conspiracy things. And, uh, and all they would do is wind up a lot of Americans, wind up some of my members, and it's not that they, they can say whatever they want to say. My point in the book was they sure as my, my job a lot harder. Well, yeah, but also, I mean, didn't you campaign for some of those freedom? Oh, yeah, I campaigned members? for a lot of them. Listen, now, the American people elect 435 members of Congress, and uh, the leaders have no control over who they are. I may go out and help them because they're running as a Republican, uh, but uh, they show up in Washington, and you never know what you're going to get. I spend a lot of time, as do the other leaders, helping new members become good members, uh, helping them uh, with their staff decisions, how they set up their offices, uh, and try to get them uh, hooked up with some uh, incumbent members that they're comfortable with uh, and help show them the, the way a little bit. Uh, but, uh, you know, some, some, not, not very many, but some of them, uh, because I was, quote, the establishment, uh, I had to, uh, there's something had to be wrong with me. And so uh, <laughs> here I was, the rabble rouser reformer uh, for most of my career, and now I'm the establishment. Uh, I, I used to marvel at that. But, you know, if you're the Speaker of the House, yes, you're the establishment. Well, but, you know, one of the one of the criticisms I've seen of the book is that, you know, it seems like for some some people have said that, look, the Republican Party uh enjoyed that the enthusiasm and the energy that some of the what you call like the crazy right brought in and sort of rode that wave to a majority um but you know you have to open the door for a, a varied group of people no no you, on, you, know, you sort of you make said, a deal with the devil there you know you said open the door i didn't open the door the american people elect these people and send them to washington 
Now, most of the Tea Party crowd, frankly, became good, solid Republicans. Uh, but, you know, on any given day, I'd have 210 votes, 215. Uh, but that's nothing if you don't have 218 votes, which is a majority. And on any given day, I'd have a couple dozen of these knuckleheads uh, where it was either their way or the highway. They wanted it all their way or they didn't want to play ball at all. Well, it just doesn't work that way in politics. Uh, you know, I call it the chaos caucus. Uh, uh, but in addition to that problem, you got 435 independently elected members of Congress, some of the smartest people in America and some of the dumbest. Some of the nicest people you'd ever meet and some of the raunchiest. I mean, it was. <laughs> now, I was, I was ready for this. I grew up in a family of, with 11 brothers and sisters. My parents and my grandmother lived with us. Uh, I grew up working around a bar uh, where, you know, you have to learn to deal with every that walks in the door. Trust me, all that background and experience helped me when I was uh, the leader. But trust me, it's crazy. Uh, there's a lot of moving bodies, a lot of moving parts, and I enjoyed it. I'm kind of just kind of the way I was I was raised. I enjoyed it. Uh, but anybody thinks that uh, the founders designed the Congress to be efficient uh, really hasn't read uh, much about uh, our founding. They put this big body in. It, they put this big body in the middle of our government called the Congress, knowing that the country would grow. And that the Congress would grow. And if it got big enough, they'd never be able to agree on anything, which is exactly what the founding fathers envisioned, uh, because they don't want some strong, big federal government. They've got to be up in heaven, uh, rolling in laughter at what goes on every day, uh, because it's hard to get anything done. Uh, well, yeah. And to your point, you know, kind of by by design. Uh, and you actually you start the book talking about the uh, the events of January 6th and uh, just, you know, about how heartbreaking it was for someone who cares so much about politics and the institutions uh, to see to see that happen. And, and we do have a, a question from one of our viewers who says uh, that uh, they were born and raised in Middletown, Ohio, and they want your honest assessment of the modern, I would say, I guess, current Republican Party. Well, uh, you know, as I said earlier, I'm a traditional Republican. I believe in a smaller, less costly, and more accountable government. Uh, I believe that trade's good for our, our country, fiscal responsibility. Uh, but uh, uh, that seems to have been forgotten here lately uh, because, uh, you know, you've got some what I call some more radical types who, who Donald Trump has brought into the party. And, uh, and so... Uh, you know, how they move ahead, I have no idea. As I say early in my book, if you're looking for the 15-point plan to save America or save the world, this is not the book for you because I'm not going to give it to you. Uh, it's, just not, it's just not what I do. But let's go back to January 6th. Uh, I don't watch much TV. I certainly don't watch any news on TV. Uh, I, I can't find any place where I can actually figure out what the news is uh, without a million opinions. Uh, I read a lot, which is enough. And so one of my staffers texted me on January 6th and said, you better turn the TV on. And I happened to be home. I turned the TV on and watched uh, the chaos of the Capitol for about an hour. Uh, I was angry, sad. Uh, one of the darkest days in American history. Uh, but I could, not, I could not watch it anymore. Couldn't do it. And, uh, and then I thought about uh, uh, what I had heard President Trump do every day after the election uh, for two months leading up to January 6th, uh, telling people the election had been stolen uh, and uh, providing no evidence, no evidence, no facts. I kept looking for him. I've been around elections for 40 years. Uh, I know something about the typical problems and maybe the unusual problems you have in elections. Uh, but I never saw an ounce of evidence. Uh, and, uh, you know, as someone who voted for Trump, uh, I felt abused. I felt my loyalty to him with my vote uh, was being abused. And, uh, and I think the president uh, took the loyalty that 70 million Americans uh, handed him and just flushed it down the toilet. Uh, it was a uh, bad performance. Uh, well, I mean, you do talk a bit about Trump in the book. I mean, you had known him long before he ever 
even ran for president, or at least you had met him before, right? You sort of, um, you, well, I was one of the few stories. people in Washington uh, who had any idea who Donald Trump really was uh, before he was elected. And, uh, you know, I've known Trump now for probably, I don't know, 15 years, maybe a little longer. Uh, when you play golf with someone, you get to know them. They can't hide who they are on the golf course. They tee that ball up uh, and they're competing. Guess what? Whoever they are, the real person shows up. <laughs> I've seen it time and time again. So I got to know Donald Trump pretty well. Uh, we spent a lot of time together. Uh, but never once in my entire uh, time with him that I ever thought I was looking at a future president of the United States. Uh, but you did endorse him, you know, back in 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 2016, at least. Uh, after I endorsed Jeb Bush. And, oh, after okay. I, and after I endorsed John Kasich. Was this just your not Ted Cruz vote? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh no, I was not going to vote for Ted Cruz. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, by the time it got to the end of April, it was pretty clear Donald Trump was going to be uh, the nominee. I was at Stanford University, and uh, this political scientist, uh, uh, I was on stage in front of a big audience trying to get me to say I would vote for I would, I would endorse Donald Trump or I would vote for him. And I, and I said, if Donald Trump is a Republican nominee, I'll vote for him. Well, I wasn't in the car 10 minutes. The phone rings. Donald Trump. Hey, man, man, man. Hey, thanks. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you. I said, Donald, you know, you weren't my first choice. No, no, I know. I, I know. I said, well, Donald, you weren't my second choice either. But you are going to be the nominee, and I'll, and I'll support you. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> me, I got to be upfront and frank with everybody. What uh, so you have a special uh, a special hatred for Ted Cruz, and I do want to talk a little bit about that. He recently, I think, tried to do a fundraiser where he basically told his supporters, "Give me two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and I will um, destroy this book in some way, um, sort of publicly or on video." Um, but, but, you know, he probably didn't need that much pushing because, <laughs> because you are, <laughs> you really don't pull, uh, you know, any punches and we're not really allowed to curse on this, right. on this uh, medium. So I, I, there's very little I can quote from the book here about him, but, um, <laughs> listen, uh, you know, as I say in the book, there's nothing worse than a, a reckless jackass. I'll say who thinks he's smarter than everybody else. Here, this guy isn't even a member of the House. He's a member of the Senate, uh, who I, he never came to my office. I never talked to him after he was elected to office. Uh, and uh, uh, he's riling up uh, my knucklehead caucus uh, in projects uh, that are, one, destructive, two, have no chance of success, uh, and they all, they all lead to one place, a dead end. Uh, and I would, uh, <laughs> and this guy just kept it up and kept it up. And so in my book, you know, I nudge a few people, uh, but there's one guy that uh, there was no reason to hold back. Uh, he's the most miserable SOB I ever had to work with. Simple as that. Hey, Cruz. Yes. And, you know, and I was told, and I wanted to ask you, so at the end of your audio book that you said that you were, I pointed out that you recorded yourself, you, you said you have a special message for Ted Cruz there at, at the end. Uh, what was that just, you know, I'm here. I might as well take advantage that's of the opportunity. Brain, to... uh, that's what I call a Boehner brain fart. <laughs> I got to the end of the book and uh, the engineers, everybody started to applaud and we're finished. And I said, no, no, I got a PS at the end of this book. Oh, are you already? Yeah, we're ready. P.S. Ted Cruz, go screw yourself. But I use a little bit more colorful language. <laughs> um, I don't know. Just, um, I just, I just did it. Hey, it's your audio book. You could, uh, you could That's do it. Right. Have you heard from any of the people? Because you really tee off on like him and like Michelle Bachman, Mark Meadows. Have you heard oh, from any of those? I don't tee off on. I don't tee off on them near as bad as I tee off on Cruz. Fair, but I mean, it's. Well, I've, a, not heard from a, I've not heard from any of them. You haven't heard from. Um, oh, okay. Or from uh, Hannity. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, you tell some really good stories about Mark Meadows. How did you feel when he was made chief of staff in the middle of the COVID 
crisis. You don't have a well, opinion of him, but but there he was, the president's chief of staff in in March of 2020, in the in the, in the middle of this serious crisis. Listen, Donald Trump never wanted a chief of staff. But he wanted a, a water boy, an errand boy. Uh, that's why he got Mark Meadows. Uh, it's a uh, you know, he never used his chief of staff. He did everything he could to go around him. So, uh, yeah, I, I pretty much chuckled when it happened because uh, I thought that kind of made for each other. Uh, <laughs> there's also a, uh, an audience question here where uh, someone is asking, um, are, what's your relationship with President Obama like now? And looking back, do you still think that trying to strike a grand bargain on taxes and spending um, was a good idea, given resistance on both sides? Well, the grand bargain, uh, 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 it's still my greatest political disappointment. The president and I spent weeks uh, negotiating a, a $5.2 trillion deficit reduction plan in the first 10 years. Uh, but the things that were in this package uh, would have lasted 50 years. Uh, it would not have solved our entire uh, deficit and spending problem, but it would have made a huge dent in it. Uh, listen, uh, I became speaker. President Obama uh, was president. Uh, he's a Democrat. I'm a Republican. The American people won't care. They expect us to figure it out. And while we are vastly uh, different, you know, I grew up a little differently than he did. I went to different schools than he did. Uh, we're really different, but Listen, I know what the uh, what the American people expected, and I went out of my way to develop a relationship uh, with Barack Obama. Uh, a lot of people in my party didn't appreciate it. Get over it, uh, because uh, you know you don't you're not going to get things accomplished if you don't have a relationship and some level of trust uh, with the other side, and in this case, with President Obama. So uh, we had a nice relationship then, and we still do. Oh, interesting. Now you're both retired. Maybe you can... even when we were in office, uh, we, we, we had our battles, but we had a lot of light moments as well. Uh, I have here on my list of questions, um, the words Mitch McConnell. Uh, <laughs> just what he's such an enigma. And I think even for, for, I think across the spectrum, I think people who are who support him and people who don't uh, find him so mysterious. What is he like to work with? Is there anything you can tell us about him? Does he collect antique teapots? Does he love show? Uh, he, uh, is there anything he, you can tell us? <laughs> he literally is uh, an enigma, uh, as mysterious as you can imagine. Uh, he, I've never seen anyone who could hold their cards closer to their chest than Mitch McConnell. And I got to see more of those cards than almost anybody certainly more than his own members in the Repu of the Republicans in the Senate. Uh, but over the years, I got to know Mitch very well. And, uh, you know, every once in a while, he'd smile. <laughs> he wouldn't know what to do. Uh, but uh, Mitch, is, uh, Mitch is a really bright uh, leader. Uh, he's, uh, he's a very good politician and a very good leader. And uh, the Republican members of, of the Senate have uh, enormous uh, faith and confidence in him. Uh, but uh, he, he's, not, uh, he's not anything like uh, what you would describe as a usual politician. Uh, yeah, I mean, his choice of, uh, of a profession is, you know, usually you think, oh, people who really love to meet people and are really outgoing sort of are drawn to elective life, an elective office. And then every once in a while you get, you get other people who don't fit that mold who you go, oh, okay. Interesting choice. <laughs> interesting right. choice of, of career. He's a real, he's a real inside player. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nobody that knows the rules of the Senate better than he does. Uh, and they've got some pretty arcane rules. Uh, and, uh, and he knows his members, he knows their states, he knows their interests. And, uh, uh, he's, uh, he's a, he's a, you wouldn't want to play poker with this guy, David. <laughs> we also have some, we have some other audience questions coming in. Um, one person asked, "Who are some of the rising stars in the Republican Party now that we should pay attention to?" Well, I like uh, Liz Cheney. I think she's a really bright lady. Uh, Elise Stefani, upstate New York, uh, another very bright lady uh, who uh, I helped get to Congress, and uh, I think she's done a marvelous job. Uh, you know, I got a guy named Anthony Gonzalez, who's a member. 
uh, from uh, Akron, Ohio. Really bright, uh, hardworking guy. But there's, I just rattled off a couple of names. There are a lot of really good guys. Richard Hudson uh, from North Carolina, or Patrick McHenry from North Carolina. Uh, there's, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of really bright people. But, you know, what I've learned over the years is you just never know uh, who's going to emerge. Uh, you know, while I know these members pretty well, I know their, their assets, their liabilities, uh, but you just never can quite tell uh, who begins to climb up the ladder and who maybe decides, well, eh, this is as far as I'm going to climb the ladder. Uh, do you miss anything about Washington, D.C.? Do you miss the food? Do you miss the Secret Service? Do you miss uh, uh, everybody whispering when you walk in the room? No, I, I tell you what, uh, I don't re- have any remorse or regret about anything since I left. I, I, I couldn't be happy. Uh, but, you know, that human interaction, uh, the members. I mean, I would, I would uh, talk to 100 members every day, at least. Wow. Walking down the hall in the chamber, you know, somebody needs a haircut. Somebody's clothes didn't fit right. Somebody's got the ugliest tie on you've ever seen. <laughs> I look at a member and say, hey, just because somebody gave you that tie doesn't mean you have to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is men, women. I mean, I'm getting all kinds of trouble these days. Uh, but I'm a, <laughs> Trey Gowdy. Trey Gowdy would wear these suits, and I'd say, Trey, just because you inherited this suit from your grandfather doesn't mean you have to wear it. Uh, I mean, so every day I was out there mucking it up with the members. Uh, secondly, the staff. My staff mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of other staff on the Hill who I've met over the years. Uh, these are the people who really make the place run. Uh, they're smart. They're dedicated people. And I had the best uh, team, if you will, on the Hill. Uh, it's uh, You can only accomplish so much in life without a good team around you. Uh, and I had uh, a team that uh, I love. They love me. I didn't think I was any more important part of that team than anybody on the team. I didn't think I was any more important than anybody on the team. We all had a role to play. I had mine to play. They had theirs to play. Uh, but uh, I really do miss uh, the staff and the members. But, you know, I get to talk to them. I mean, I get text, emails, phone calls from members, staff uh, all the time, especially here in the last couple of weeks since this uh, book was about to come out. Uh, I have heard from hundreds of them. <laughs> I've had a lot of people saying, you know, you said what I wish I could say, kind of. Uh, oh, I think there's a lot of people... There are a lot of people jealous that uh, that I am the way I am. Uh, in in yeah, sense, yeah, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Tell us the way it is. Um, well, you know, yeah, it's interesting. You ever seen the movie Titanic? No. Oh well, oh, so Titanic. I saw Titanic. Yeah, you see. So at the beginning, I'm not Jack, a big movie guy, but I saw Titanic. Yeah, right. I mean, I was every, at the beginning. Jack Dawson he wins the tickets to go on the boat in a card game, right? right? Some some other guy loses them in the card game and then Jack wins and he runs off. And so, but I feel like if you turn the camera and like the guy who just lost the game, um, you know, maybe he's sad, but then later he's like, no, 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 that was a really good thing. Like, do you ever think, do you ever feel like that with, with like in terms of your timing? Like, no. you know, maybe it was well, sad to leave, but well, you know what? maybe, well, maybe almost, I don't want to be there right now. Almost everybody I run into, which are dozens of people every day, uh, will typically say one of two things. Boy, was your timing good. Or we really miss you. You need to go back. Oh, really? <laughs> no. Would you ever consider going back or running for any other kind of elective office? No. I, mean, I know you're in Florida now. I'm sure you're getting no. set up by people to run for this or that. No, 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 no. As I said uh, Sunday on Meet the Press, I'd rather set myself on fire than to run for public office again. <laughs> which may make you that much more appealing for, for voters. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, some of the um, uh, other questions that have come in, one person wants to know, what are, how would you describe President Biden? Like, what are some adjectives you would use? What are three adjectives you would use to, des- to describe President Biden? And what do you think are, are his strengths and weaknesses? Uh, I, listen, I think he's gregarious. Uh, he's serious. And he's a good politician. I mean, he, this guy's been around a while. He, he understands politics. Uh, you know, uh, 
Joe has only got one issue that, you know, he's kind of been known for. And he can, he can, he can make some gaps when he speaks. Now we all do it, uh, but he seems to do it more than, than most members I know. But other than that, he's just a good, he's a good guy. He's a really good guy. I love it. Uh, yeah, you write in the book um, about Gerald Ford and, and golfing with Gerald Ford and how much you enjoyed it. It's really a lovely uh, chapter about he, him and your um, college, I mean, sorry, your high school football coach uh, that I think folks that are watching read that chapter. It's really, it's really lovely. Um, it took me any- forever to record that chapter because, you know, when you read a book, you have to enunciate every word and then you don't want it to sound like you're reading. You want it to sound like you're having a conversation. And then parts of this book get a little emotional and I can get a little teary eyed pretty quickly. I've heard. Uh, and so here are this chapter is entitled Jerry and Jerry, uh, Jerry Faust, my high school football coach and Jerry Ford, uh, the former president, my old buddy. Uh, I didn't think I'd ever get through this chapter. I'd oh. stop, wipe my eyes, blow my nose, take a deep breath, start again, stop, wipe my eyes, blow my nose. I think I'd ever get through the chapter. <laughs> It's, it's, it's really, really moving. And, and did you ever talk to your high school football coach and sort of run into him later? And, um, Oh no, I talked to him, I don't know, two or three times a year and have been every year. Oh, Oh, Um, good friend. Are there any politicians now? I know you love to golf with Gerald Ford. Are there any politicians now that you regularly enjoy playing golf with? No, I don't. Uh, I don't play golf with politicians anymore. I used to play with a lot of them because I, we were friends. We were doing golf events together, or, and uh, you know, I play a lot of golf with Saxby Jambos, uh, former senator from Georgia, Richard Burr, former or uh, current senator from North Carolina, Tom Latham. Uh, the three of them, my, my three best buddies in Congress, and uh, we got. I got there in ninety. The three of them got there in nineteen ninety four, but. Uh, the four of us uh, were stuck together like glue. You know, Harry Truman was fond of saying, hey, in Washington, you want a friend? Get a dog. <laughs> well, you know, guess what, Harry? Uh, you're wrong. Uh, I had three of the best friends you could ever have. Uh, but, you know, I've played golf with a lot of members uh, over the years, but not anymore. Do you still play much? I mean, you're in Florida now. I, I, I still play golf. I don't play near the golf I used to play. Have you played uh, a lot? I used to play. I used to play hundred rounds a year. Uh, you know, I played a lot of golf. Uh, typically, a lot of it, what I'll call political golf. Uh, but after I retired, uh, I don't know. It just didn't seem like I wanted to play as much. And thinking about this, I realized that golf was my escape from all the craziness. Well, the craziness went away, so I didn't need to escape. <laughs> You're in the escape now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Now, one of the biggest jobs of the House Speaker that, I, that people might not realize is that you have to go around and fundraise for everybody all the time. And that may be part of why you had to play so much golf. Um, but what is it? Honestly, when I think about I mean, I love politics, but when I think about the prospect of running for office, fundraising is just sort of the worst part. And it is a real sort of, you know, roadblock um, for for a number of people who may be considering public office. I mean, what does it take to do that, to be really good at it? Um, so good at it, you know, maybe that you, that you get to be the speaker, but, but it's something that you seem to have a talent for. Well, I have to remember before I end up in Congress, I was a president of a sales and marketing company in the packaging and plastics industry. So, you know, I was used to asking for the order, just like you got to get used to asking for the money. <laughs> and uh, I hated it. I hated every, I, I didn't, I hated asking people for money. It made me vomit, but I had to do it. Wow. And I had to make myself do it. I was very good at it, but I hated it. All right. Uh, but I, I spent a lot of time doing it. I was just thinking about that when you were talking about this fundraiser, I was thinking about a night I was in San Francisco. I was staying at the, uh, uh, the Ritz Carlton in San Francisco and, we were on the elevator going down to the garage with my security guys and one of my staffers. And, uh, the elevator stopped and this older couple got on in there. Uh, he had a tuxedo on. She had a, a very nice uh, a formal dress on. And, 
and uh, kind of glanced at me and glanced at me and gave me the eye. And finally, uh, uh, she said, uh, the lady said, uh, well, we're the enemy. And I looked at him. I said, the enemy. I said, we're all Americans for God's sake. <laughs> There's no such thing as an enemy. Uh, but I, uh, I traveled all over the country, uh, literally nonstop on behalf of the party or on behalf of members. I've been in uh, every state more times than you can count. Uh, I've seen uh, almost all of America, not all of it, but almost all of it. And uh, frankly, turned it into fun. Uh, this is a, this is really amazing to hear that you uh, wanted to vomit at the prospect of fundraising since that's just well, it's something you spent so much time doing. That is an incredible ta uh, to have a talent for, to do something that you hate is really <laughs> yeah, right. such a strange situation to be in. Now, um, you do talk about uh, the voters and the voters responsibility in this book and sort of what what um, what role we play in, in getting, you know, what do they say that the, the Congress you deserve really. Um, and, and, and about, um, part of the problem, you say part of the problem, if we're going to be really honest about it is that we, the people put up with all this malarkey. We prefer the easy outrage over focusing our attention on tough questions that don't have five second solutions. Uh, and, and so what's to be done? I mean, how do you get people to, to come off of that? That seems like a really, um, almost, uh, natural, I, I don't want to, you know, well, it, but, here, here, but it here. seems like the easy answer is, is, is the one we want to reach for. We're busy, you know? Well, here's, uh, here's today's problem. America is very divided, uh, politically more so than any time of my lifetime. And, uh, and the members and the leaders are all being held hostage by the loudest voices in their districts. Uh, the far left for Democrats, far right for Republicans. And uh, uh, what we need, uh, we need more traditional Democrats and traditional Republicans uh, to play a bigger role in the primary process. You know, most districts in America who wins the primary is gonna win the jump. And, uh, and who, who shows up most in a, in a primary? On the Republican side, it would be the right of the right. On the Democrat side, it'd be the left of the left. We need more traditional uh, party members to play a more active role. And what will happen is we'll get some more reasonable members out of the process. Well, yeah, in California, we have an open primary system and watching that we've had that for a little while, just several election cycles. And it's been really interesting. We have a top two, just sort of whoever the top two are get to, you know, go on to the to the general. And it, um, you know, it's been gamed a little bit, but like any like any system. Um, but in certain places, it, it really has gotten us more moderate uh, represent mostly on the state level, um, the state representatives and senators in, in certain areas. Um, and so, you know, what are your thoughts on, on those kinds of fixes really sort of trying to fundamentally fix or change the primary process that keeps producing these extremes? I don't think, uh, I don't think it's the answer. I think, uh, uh, it requires, uh, uh, more traditional party members to show them vote. I think that's the ultimate answer uh, to get uh, what I'll call more reasonable members. They can be liberal. Nancy uh, Pelosi is a liberal Democrat, uh, but she's reasonable. Right? She understands how to get things done. Wouldn't it be interesting to see somebody run who just says, uh, my platform, I'm not going to go to Washington and change everything. I'm going to go and I'm going to make deals and I'm going to trade away things you don't care about for things that you do care about. <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm going to schmooze and, you know, do whatever I have to do to get things done for this district and, and to see how that person would do, they might actually do pretty well. I never made them. I never made any campaign promises. Uh, the only campaign promise I ever made was in 1990. Uh, some guy got on me about earmarks. And I looked at him and said, listen, if you think my job is to go to Washington and rob the federal treasury on behalf of my district, you're voting for the wrong guy. Uh, I, I never made one commitment about any vote other than they were going to get, I'm just going to give them my best. Uh, my best is listening to my constituents in terms of what they want and also using my own background and judgment uh, on an issue and together come to a decision. 
It's what I did for 25 years. Uh, I wouldn't change one vote that I ever cast. Never really have. Uh, probably five votes of my entire career. I could have gone this way or this way. Uh, but is, this is not that difficult to look people in the eye and say, I'm going to do my best. For you. Trust me. Well, I mean, do you, would you think you would have a difficult, maybe, I mean, I'm sure people in your district love you, but maybe somewhere else, you know, with your politics, do you think you'd have a hard time getting elected today? I mean, you talk about how Ronald Reagan couldn't get elected. Well, hell yes. Today's Republican party. I'd have a hell of a tough time getting elected in this, in this uh, chaos that we have today. Listen, it's bad enough. Uh, during the 25 years I was there, which I talk about in the book, but my God, since then, uh, it's gotten a lot more difficult. Yeah, they, uh, they, uh, they <laughs> I'd have a tough time. Uh, <laughs> now you, uh, is there anything that gives you, uh, hope? I mean, you know, we've got a lot of, uh, issues. I, again, I, I can't curse, so I can't quote you directly about how you describe the current situation, but, um, but not good. Uh, so, um, is there any, any, uh, no. anything? Listen, in the book you- I outline, you know, I wanted part of this book to be about hope. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that, uh, like we're the most resilient people God ever put on earth, Americans. Uh, and uh, immigration has been great for our country. It's allowed our country to grow. It's allowed our country to have the diversity that we have. And, uh, uh, and I'm a big believer in America. You know, uh, in 1940, uh, when uh, the England was being bombed and about to lost the war, and America was still sitting on the sidelines, uh, Winston Churchill uh, was down on the floor of the House of Commons as prime minister, uh, giving a speech and just pounding the hell out of the U.S. And he says, those Americans, those Americans, <clears throat> they'll make every mistake known to man until they get it right. You know, while we make mistakes, but we're always at it. We always figure it out. And guess what? We'll figure this out as well. Yeah, there's there was this... I remember it was a warning because I'm I'm old enough to remember it was a warning. But uh, that you know, once Russia really became less of a an enemy, and then that the country would turn on itself uh, because we didn't have the sort of common external force. Um, and you you were, have been in politics sort of throughout um, that process. Do you do you think that that's part of what's happening? Do we do we need a, a good old fashioned Somebody else to focus on? <laughs> Somebody else to focus no. on? No. No. Uh, uh, I've watched this develop over the last 30 years, this mountain of information that now falls uh, on the shoulders of every American, whether it's uh, talk radio, whether it's cable news, uh, whether it's every social media platform known to man. Uh, they're getting hundreds of times more stuff than they did when I got into this in 1990. Uh, some of it's true, some of it's nonsense. Uh, but what it's done, it's just divided the country. And now people have social media platforms where they're spewing out all kinds of nonsense. Every conspiracy theory known to man. You know, at some point, people are going to realize, well, oh, this is just that, nonsense. Uh, and at some point, somebody's actually going to start providing news. You know, I want to see a news report where it's news. I don't need anybody's opinion mixed in there. I want to see what the news is. Uh, and at some point, uh, Americans, I think, will, will start to, to come back together. At some point, they're going to get tired of nothing happening in Washington and begin to demand that people work together to get something accomplished. Well, it's interesting you talk about the news. I mean, in the in terms of the media, you uh, you talk and as, as a journalist, I was interested to see how you refer to reporters as alligators, and you would go out and feed <laughs> feed the alligators. <laughs> well, listen, when you've got to deal with the press several times every week, and you know, one of them there would be about thirty reporters. Uh, uh, then toward the end of the week, I would do this press conference would involve about fifty reporters, and uh, and. Yeah, I didn't call them alligators. I said, doing a press conference is like feeding the alligators. The goal is to feed them without getting bit. <laughs> well, which is true. Yeah, I wonder how many politicians know, like as a reporter, when you're going out, you just, you want some content. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I feel like people would get very defensive for no reason or think, oh, I'll just, you know, sort of avoid this. Um, when I always actually- had a very good relationship with the press. 
Mm. Uh, because uh, while I had a job to do, yeah, they have a job to do. And if I was going to speak to the press, uh, you know, I wanted to be helpful to them in terms of give, giving them as much information as I could uh, without overplaying my hand. And, uh, <laughs> and it worked out fine. I was straight up with them. But if I didn't feed them, they're going to go out and feed on their own. And God knows where they're going to feed. So I'd rather take the time uh, <laughs> to, to help do my best to feed them the truth. <laughs> So my uh, one of the people who reviewed your book said, uh, you know, he is good and well done with politics since he's being honest. It seems like in this book, uh, it was this process liberating. I mean, did you sort of hit send and go, all right, well, I've, that felt good to kind of say what you wanted to say. Not really. I, I, I just didn't have any ax to grind. I didn't No, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't, I just don't do that. no, uh, I wanted to tell the story. I wanted it to, be, it to be entertaining. I wanted it to sound like me. And uh, I accomplished those goals. And I'm glad people uh, appear to love the book. I hope everybody watches this loves the book. Enjoy it. It's fun. I'm sure and anyone you, and you'll laugh. who you is interested really in politics laugh. enough to watch this would get a big kick out of the book. Some of these, I, I'm trying not to spoil everything, but there's just some really amazing stories in here. And I just, uh, we have time for, I think, um, one more question here. And I wanted to, I was saving this one because I well, listen, this is always, you know, when I, when I press conferences, other events, there's always that last question. <laughs> Columbo. Just one more question. That last question. Uh, no, it's a very sweet question. It would be a nice one to sort of end okay. this, uh, the interview on. And it says, um, what is the best piece of advice that your father ever gave you? If you do the right things for the right reasons, the right things will probably happen. Just don't worry about it. I told my members this every day. Whether you vote yes or no, somebody, one of your constituents is not going to be happy. So you might as well do what you think's right. It just don't worry about it. Well, you know, what is that old, the old rule? The, um, the, the number one job of a politician is to get reelected, which is cynical, but, but also true. <laughs> it seems like uh, they're just willing to say whatever they need to, to get elected sometimes. No, not you, but, but some people come to it well, and just say, whatever I need to say, because you know, Melissa, sometimes they don't believe the things they're saying. You Melissa, know Melissa, I'm not buying it. I, I worked around this process for a long time. And I'll just say this, 90% of the members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans alike, good, decent, honest people trying to do their best for their constituents and for the country. Now, the other 10% on both sides, the fringe, yeah, I can do without. Uh, but uh, members members are good people. Uh, yeah, there's a few politicians out there who, who like to make noise, but that's not what uh, where most of the members of Congress are. You're right. I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm just saying that, you know, it seems it's if if people really believe some of the things that they say, that's actually frightening. Like it's uh, it's (laughs) I hope you know that this is nonsense. Right. (laughs) Surely you've seen people, you know, go out and say something and then go, oh, my gosh, you know, I had to because of the, you know, the ethanol, the sugar lobby, the ethanol lobby, whatever it was. Um, whatever group I need to appeal to right now, um, I can throw some, some red meat to that group. Uh, and so, you know, it ends up sort of spiraling to the edges when people are Uh, trying to just say things to get elected. I saw a few things like that over the years, but not, not frankly, not very often. Actually, people do believe all the crazy stuff they say. I know. (laughs) That's worse. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Well, this has been such a treat. Thank you so much for making time uh, today. Thank you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. Um, I encourage all viewers to check out the book, John Boehner's on the house. It is a really, really interesting read. If you want to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth club efforts, please visit commonwealthclub.org. I'm Melissa Kane. Thank you so much to Speaker Boehner. Thank you to all the viewers. Thank you.